I'm Mandeep Kaur Nija, and this is my hometown of Hitchin. In the 60s, many South Asians moved to the UK, and some, like my family, moved to Hitchin in the hope of starting a new life abroad. We, their children, were the first to be born and raised in this country, and so I'm interested in exploring how other children of the diaspora, particularly women like myself, shaped and navigated their hybrid identity as British Asians in Hertfordshire. I want audiences to resonate and relate with the people in this film who paved the way for a new and multicultural definition of what it means to be a British Asian. So this exhibition is really important, um, not only for me personally, but also for the town. Um, a lot of people don't know the history of how the Punjabi or the South Asian community actually migrated and settled here. Um, it dates back to late 50s. My granddad came here in the 60s and to Hitchin. He moved here, um, slowly brought the family over. Um, they had businesses here. They worked in factories. Um, and then my, my dad, he was 11 when, when he came here. Uh, he went to Walshed Acre, which is a local primary school, and then continued kind of, you know, living in the town, working in the town, um, until my mum came over from India in the 70s. They got married, and then they had my brothers and I. So these stories are very, very important because it's... The immigrant story is is very important because... The sacrifices that were made by our grandparents and our ancestors, they really should be documented and archived. And I'm a big believer of that because those stories have inspired us and they've given us the freedom to live the life that we live today. They're important pieces of our history and they're important pieces of our DNA. And if they're not archived and their stories are not told to future generations, I feel like that will be a, a massive injustice. Um... The stories that we're documenting for this exhibition are mainly women's stories and the the children of immigrants. So the immigrants face their own um, issues, the first generation, language barriers, um, issues with settling in, um, integration. And then they went on to have children, people like myself, who we faced our own challenges where we were born into a country where we adopted two cultures and we would try try to find our identity between them those stories are are very important because although they faced their issues there were different issues to what the, the first generation faced and um i think that generation actually paved the way for future generations because they um they had to um fight their parents and they had to um push boundaries massively to fit in and um, some of them went against their culture some of them went went against their religion and um, they normalized a lot of things that we do today I think one of the great things about the South Asian community and the Punjabi community in Hitchin is that we've got a very very strong work ethic so um, from the moment that they landed in Hitchin um, our ancestors our grandparents worked in um, factories there's a few factories in particular that everybody worked at. Um, one of them was Fermax, and um, Fermax was a was a was a great place because it gave a lot of financial freedom to South Asian women. There was a time when women didn't work; they were homemakers, so they were at home bringing up their children. But um, Fermax really gave um, these women financial freedom and kind of freedom from the home because it took them away from the everyday duties of home care um, and allowed them to kind of interact with other women um, from similar backgrounds who are going through similar things. So the ladies that worked at Fairmarks, they would have different celebrations. So they would celebrate Diwali, they would celebrate Christmas, and um, everybody wanted to wear the best suits. And um, my mum, she used to make um, Punjabi suits and I and I remember my mum would sometimes be awake till one or two o'clock in the morning making suits for the women who worked at Fermax because they wanted to wear the best suit when they got to work the next day. Oh, 
So weddings were a very big part of our life as well. And growing up in Hitchin, we didn't miss a wedding. I mean, if somebody was getting married, we'd all be invited and the whole family would go. And back then, there wasn't really a limit on the number of people who could go. So, uh, which is quite common now. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, obviously. But it's quite common now to have a limited number of people invited to a wedding. But back then, um, if you had guests over from another town and they would just turn up to your house, because that happened quite often, we would say, oh, we've got a wedding to go to today. And they'd be like, okay. And they would just come along as well. <laughs> so you'd end up going to a wedding that you'll be five of you invited and there'll be 10 of you that turn up. And that was quite normal back then. But the great thing about weddings in the town um, in Hitchin were that everybody mucked in. So you didn't have cake, fancy catering companies. You didn't have, um, you know, fancy decor. It was a case of just rolling up some white sheets, putting them on the <laughs> on the table, sellotaping it up, plastic cups and um, drinks on the table. And food was served by your local auntie or your local uncle. Food was cooked by the local aunties. And everybody would just muck in and just help out. And it was it was great because it never felt forced. And it was just something that you had to do. You just have to go and help. You shouldn't sit like you're a guest. You must go and help. And um, Hitchin Town Hall, um, where this exhibition is, um, is going to be displayed, um, is where all the weddings took place. And um, there were just late night events happening. It was just it was just a great experience, and we had many live bands perform there. Um, so a lot of the Bhangra bands that were popular during the eighties, like Hira, for example, they have performed in Hitchin and many many others. So um, so weddings were were a great place, and there was a great social event as well. Again, because as girls we weren't, we weren't really allowed to go out, so there were great social events because we could dance there, we could eat there, we could laugh there, and we could all just have an, an amazing time. I think growing up in the eighties in Hitchin. It was, it was fun because in Hitchin we had this sense of community. So we always felt like there was somebody that we could turn to and talk to and hang out with. So it was fun in that sense. But I think from an identity perspective, it was difficult to actually find where you belonged because we had this strong Punjabi culture that we grew up in. And, you know, it was very strict. Um, there was a lot of focus around religion, going to the Gurdwara, the temple, the Sikh temple. And then you would go to school and your friends were non-Punjabi, non-Brown, um, who didn't necessarily have strict parents as we had them. And they didn't really have religion as part of their um, everyday kind of upbringing. Um, so while we were trying to navigate what our identity was, learning a, another language, um, living with all of these restrictions that we had and being God-fearing, and then we were kind of going into a world on a daily basis, like school, where those things weren't that important. So having that freedom, essentially, when you were going out into the world and going to school, and then as soon as you walk through your front door, it would be a completely different world. So I don't think I really knew what my identity was. I, I genuinely didn't know. I just knew I had to survive at home with all the rules and the restrictions that we had. And then I knew that I had to make it work at school and figure out that balance myself. So, um, and I, I guess now that I'm in my 40s, only now I'm beginning to realise what my identity is because you kind of like come to this sense of um, acceptance about who you are and that formulates your identity. So there wasn't really an identity then, but now I feel like I'm coming into my identity. My dad was very, very strict. Um, so growing up, we couldn't speak English at home, me and my brothers. We only were allowed to speak Punjabi. Bearing in mind, my dad came to England when he was 11 and he moved to Hitchin and he went to the schools in Hitchin. So he was quite Western in a lot of ways, but he refused for us to... He, he didn't like the idea of us losing our identity and not, uh, not learning our language. And we, we regularly attended Punjabi school. And as a result of that, I now can read and write Punjabi, which I'm really proud of. Um, but one thing he didn't like about the girls' school was that I had to wear a skirt. And um, we weren't allowed to wear trousers at the girls' school at that time. And um, as soon as I'd walk in through the door, I would have to take my shoes off at the bottom of the stairs, go straight upstairs and get changed into uh, trousers. 
And if by any chance I happen to just walk into the living room and he's sitting there and I'm talking to my mum, he would just give me that look. And I just knew that meant, what the hell are you doing? Get upstairs, get changed and come back down. And I, it obviously does impact you. Um, you know, when, you're, when your parents are so strict, um, at times you do question why, why are they so strict with you? And I think that in Punjabi households and South Asian families, the reason why it creates so much anger, I think, is because we're never really given an explanation as to why. Why are we being so strict? Why should you not? Not to say that we shouldn't wear skirts, obviously, but there was a reason behind all of these. And there was this a strong sense of protection. And um, and I think when you're a father, you're a motherly figure, you go to the extremes. You know, you don't want your children to be harmed in any way. So you think by them exposing themselves physically or being in places where they shouldn't be, they will get, someone will take advantage of that. So that's where it stems from. But when you're a child, you just think they're trying to just ruin your fun. Or like, this is not a big deal. Why can't I just wear what I want to wear? And even till when I was 12, 13, so now I'm becoming a teenager, I'm becoming more aware of my surroundings and feeling slightly embarrassed and shame, feeling ashamed of wearing Indian clothes in public in case somebody from school sees me. So he insisted that I wore... Indian suits up until my sort of, you know, late teens. And I just couldn't do it anymore because it just used to, you know, I used to be embarrassed if I go into town. I never used to want to be seen by my friends. And I remember one time sitting outside my parents' house with my dad and him, him trying to negotiate with me and reason with me. It was the first time that I remember him doing that. And he said, the reason why I want you to wear Indian clothes is because I want you to feel proud of who you are. You shouldn't be made to feel like if you wear Western clothes, you are more accepted. This is your heritage. This is your tradition. And that's why I want you to wear it. And he kind of like made his peace with it. And that was the moment he stopped asking me. And now I understand. I understand now why he did that. And I'm proud. I am proud of that. And I'm proud of the way that my dad brought me up Um Obviously, there's a lot of things that I, I questioned then, I probably do question now, but I am proud. I'm proud of my upbringing. So it's it's shaped me massively and it's made me the person, a person I am today. So I have so many fond memories of growing up in Hitchin and I love it. I love it because I grew up here. My family are here. And now what what's even more special about it is that I actually met my husband, who's from Hitchin, and we got married in Hitchin. <laughs> so... Um, and I intend to spend many, many more years living in this town. Um, my husband, he also works in the town. So we have a shop, um, Blake's on Ickleford Road. And um, so so we, I feel like I'm, my life is so integrated here. And I feel very settled here. And um, I, I look forward to many, many more years living here. So in 1972, my, um, my parents opened up um, their first shop on Was Afraid um, called S&K Stores and that was in 1972 and it's still there to this day. So we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary this year in October. And I would say that SNK Stores is, is it's one of the icons in Hitching because it's been around the longest. So my childhood memory is a lot of very playful. I would say, really just playing. We had um, three houses that were put together in, in the shops. We had 12 bedrooms. We had two different living rooms. We had a large kitchen. And underneath these three houses, we had this massive cellar where obviously all the stock was. And that really became our playground. And, um, you know, if you speak to anyone that grew up with us and used to come round, they would all know the stories of the cellar where, you know, it was quite dark down there and we'd play like ghost games down there and we'd play it and run around. Looking back, it's so dangerous. Would I want my child to play down there? No. Um, but back then, we were just a lot more fearless, I think. Um, so always thinking about going up and down Radcliffe Road and then you'll see other kids from, you know, other Indian families and, and it was Looking back, actually, we all became one big family. Even to this day, what I love is that our parents and, and that Asian community, they're still really, really close. Um, and they've never lost that bond. And, 
even those that have moved away and come back, there's this feeling that you just come back into Hitchin and we all just regress back into the 70s, back into the 80s, the 90s. And, and it's like time never passed. And when we're together, time just collapses and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, so growing up, I lived in a, um, an extraordinary type setup, quite different to most. Um, so it was my mum and my dad who had five kids. And then we also lived with my chachi and my chacha, who um, had three kids. So sibling-wise, it felt like I've, been, I've always been one of eight. And then also my granddad and my grandma lived with us as well. So there was like, imagine eight siblings, anything, you know, there was from the age of, gosh, I'm trying to think now. So the youngest, um, there would have been like 15, 16 years from the youngest to the eldest. Um, but I think, the core of family really for me was what my my granddad and my grandma brought down to then to their to then their sons and and their wives who then become our parents and what they kind of i suppose um dribbled down was was the values of of family and i never like even just having three women in a household is is extraordinary in itself and growing up I never even saw my mum and my my judgy argue never saw that once I never saw my dad and my uncle argue never once um you know there was always that kind of hierarchy I suppose of my granddad and my grandma so my mum and my judgy were always the ones would, that would be serving I suppose everybody um and that just seemed normal to me but um what is really extraordinary is that, that we just didn't see that conflict and now that I'm an older I'm an, I'm older looking back I'm sure there must have been times of conflict um but how they handled it with such grace and maturity is is how it's led me to be the woman that I am today and I think with all of our siblings how close we are then to how we are now we are exactly the same like we are we're we're still best friends, all of us, um, even, you know, the partners, the, my babia, my brother-in-laws, we all still hang out. And again, that's so unusual. Um, but it's because the values that were that were brought down from, you know, from the elderly and how how they just be in life, how they, what they taught us. And I think it's not what, they, they never taught us, or oh, this is how you should be. It was, they led by example, and I think by by watching them, and that's you know really really important. It's not what people say; it's it's how people act. Um, is looking at their actions, and by just just you know we just become like that, and we have a mutual respect for one another. Um, and so for me, going back to your initial question of. It just make, it just makes me be able to be a lot more agile in in most situations, whether it be um, in, in other family setups, um, being in 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 the workplace where you're lots surrounded by lots of different other people. Because you just have appreciation for every for 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 the differences in people. Other great childhood memories would be um, things like Christmas was a massive one for us. Um, because the shop was open um, most of the year, my dad and my chacha, my mum and my mum, my chachi were always busy in the shop. So uh, we never really had a day like most families had, like on a Sunday or, some, or something, where everyone was at home together. So Christmas was the only day of the year that we shut the shop. And it was the only day that, you know, every, we just came together as a family all day long. And that was such a novelty for us. And um, yeah, so again, massive. And even today, it's, it's still like that for Christmas Day. It kind of really symbolised a day where we felt like most other people having that family time together. I know with my older sister, so she's six years older than, older than me, so she was second out of the eight. Um, she had to grow up really, really, really quick. So because of my mum and my chachi, were in the were in the shop a lot of the time. She was the one that was sort of, I don't know, preparing our dinners and lunches and stuff. So she became our second mum. So I think for her, I'm I'm sure that she probably lost out a lot on her childhood because she was looking after all of us. 
um, and um, and I suppose from her point of view as well, sort of just listening to her over time, it it took away her quality time um, of being with 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 the mum and dads because they were always busy with us. So, but for me personally, um, I was kind of in the middle in age wise. So I got the best of both worlds. So for me. I really struggled to say what at that point did I did I see any disadvantages, um, and therefore I think I struggle now looking back. I see more advantages than disadvantages. I suppose the only thing I would say that we might have been a disadvantage was because we didn't have that front door. So little things like we always had to get up and be ready, because my granddad would always open the shop about five ten minutes earlier because there'll be a queue outside and he didn't want the customers to wait. So we'd always have to be ready. And we just didn't know what Brawne visitors would come from the temple at any given moment. So again, we had to always make sure that we were up, we were ready. It looks very different to how it was when we were young. Um, this obviously all got changed in 2010, but we do have one part, don't we, in, in one section where we all signed um, we've got to find that bit though now, where it is, that little tiny part. So this bit we used to run through here. Um, it might be on the other side, because this isn't what we've Oh, this isn't that bit then. There's, there's bits here where obviously a few people, when we change the shop over we just kind of you can see down here there's all let like me, different different people that have written different things here 2017 18 a few people here that have just signed a little bit from childhood oh yeah i remember this room this is, this is this. Yeah, there was a cold room in here oh yeah i remember the cold room oh, god and we used to we used, to lock, we used to lock each other up in the cold room as well. It's a bit dangerous. Yeah, fruit, and, fruit and bread used to be kept here. Oh my gosh, that was yeah. in here. So everything's just completely... But it brings like memories, you know? That like really... Mm. Oh, like it's quite emotional so coming down here, actually. It's all changed like... in 2010. In Letchworth, when I opened up the other, the other store, and I used to close early there, but then they... When I was doing the cashing up, they knew my office, they used to knock on the door, oh, please, 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 we got visitors just turned up, can you help us? There, there I did. And I, I just don't believe for a minute that I'm, I'm as strong as I am today if I didn't have that set up growing up and have that set up now. And, that's, and I always say to my parents that it, this, this is, you know, full credit to them because what they've taught us now is what we're now teaching our children. And me being a life coach is now what I'm teaching other people as well. So fond memories of just Gorma was uh, growing up with her in Hitchin. And actually we went to school in Bedford as well, but mostly thinking about memories in Hitchin, kind of in the Goddara, Radcliffe Road. We used to go to, uh, I used to go to Dabla class, she used to go to Vajra class, Punjabi class. We had a lot of fun there. There was only 18 months between us and having that kind of companion where you, if anyone said anything to you or you were going through something, she would always kind of like, even though we were young, we'd not talk about it, but she could either take the mick out of it and try and see the light side of it. So in terms of like fond memories, yeah, I think the companionship and going to these things, whether it be at the Godora or whether it be at, uh, whether it's like a play schemes or anything like that, we she was always there with us. We were always together. Other things that just Gormal used to stand for was her independence, her strength um, within the community. Again, kind of standing against what what the norm was. So it was typical that the boys would be okay. Let's talk about. Uh, they will be the smart ones. They'll go to uni um, and they will be doctors and lawyers. But she was like, no, like I've got an older brother. He's great and I obviously care a lot for her, but she used to see me and she used to compete with me. She used to outperform me, really. She'd be like, okay, well, you're going to uni, I'm going to go to uni. I'm she got into a better university than I did, had better grades, and she would have had a better probably career than I'm having. But she always did that. She goes, I'm not a, I'm not a woman, I'm a human. And it was the case of, 
I, and I said, I said this before, she went to uni to study maths and that's not easy. And with her brain, like she could have become one of these jobs that she could have done anything really. As I said, she could have gone investment banking. Investment banking is a male dominated field. There's uh, most people, you, men that you speak to that, uh, most investment bankers you speak to are men. Uh, and that's if you look at them, if you look at the stats now, and that's where she probably would have ended up if she if she carried on. So she used to question that. She used to go. Well, I remember I used to play football uh, for the local team. And she goes, "There's a women's team." She goes, "We go, yeah." She played for the women's team, and she played for the women's football team, Sheffield Saints, locally. So it was always like, "Well, why can't I do?" It? So she definitely had that strength and that independence, that fire in her to say, "I'm not just a girl that's going to stand by and maybe." Uh, become a, a housewife one day it was very much like I'm going to go out there and, and be the best version of myself because I've got the capability to do it so yeah always very very strong minded if she if, if she had something on her mind she wanted to focus on near enough she'd get it more than most people more than anyone I knew actually to be fair um, I get reminded of it now for my parents like how good she, and it's true that she was and I always I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it because of what she could achieve but yeah there was there was, she was definitely one that wouldn't be kind of put into a pot and saying right you need to do this she would always try and fight out of that pot and, and do what what she could to be to be a better person everything she took part on she got an a she got i think 10 a's and oh no five a's and five a stars at gcse and then a level she got four a's she did an x-ray level i think it was so she got four a's which for someone in terms of I never she was never street smart which is quite funny because she never had that she had a bit of I always call it ditziness to her but academically she was unrivaled she made me look bad she used to always be smart at homework but on top of that I think she has such a loving and warm personality as well she got on with anyone she had a very very infectious personality in the terms of she would be speaking to a bibby or she could speak to a youngster she was studying um Math, maths at uni and she had a, a plan to be an investment banker that was her plan and I 100% knew she would have got there as well so academically smart um, so friendly so loving to everyone but you couldn't want someone better in terms of like a daughter like when I and it, it made me annoyed because obviously it made me look bad in terms of my grades but for her look, I, I couldn't fault anything she ever did just Gormal got diagnosed with lymphoma cancer um, when she was 21 what I remember and the it was you know what actually the community at first when they found out struggled to really come to terms with it because she changed in her looks so she uh, put a bit of weight on because she was on steroid medication she lost her hair um, she went quite dark in her skin color so she lost the color and a natural color of her skin so physically she looked very ill even though she was quite she still had her energy to her. She still had personality and she had hope in herself. I think only after she passed and they were educated on the cancer she had, um, lymphoma Hodgkin's cancer, which is a cancer of your white blood cells, stem cell transplants, how you can actually cure yourself um, by having another person do a donor to you. They only realised that this can happen to anyone because she was a young, healthy 21-year-old. I think only afterwards, after the passing, that's where the impact on the community was we realized that there was a lot of coming together, the charity was formed, and people started understanding, right, this can happen to anyone, but there's also a little bit of a cure, we can come together on this. The community comes together to celebrate her life now with the Just Gormal Foundation. So she passed, it will be 10 years coming up in January 2023, and we created the Just Gormal Foundation three months after she passed. Now, the foundation is in her memory, it's around creating awareness around stem cell transplants and getting people onto that register what that really means is if you have a blood cancer someone can save your life by giving them your stem cells who from a healthy person that matches your skin uh, tissue type and then replace your current stem cells that you've got if you've got that blood cancer so that could be anyone that matches. it could be a, a sibling or it could be anyone that's on the register so we there's a lack of Asians on the on the register, hence why we created a charity in her name to get people onto that register. Now, that's one element of the of the charity. Um, in terms of her memory, we actually, um, over a number of years, we did a, a dinner dance event on her birthday every year in memory of the Chikomal Foundation, where all the local community comes along in a in, in Luton Auction House, and we uh, most people from Hitchin, about five six hundred people over the years. And it's a big celebration. There's food, there's drink, there's 
performances, his entertainment. And this is all together for her memory, to remember her, to remember what she stood for, enjoying herself, laughing, um, getting along, and all of her family together. She liked it when her family and friends were all together. So we've done that over the years, over a number of years. I'm hoping to do it either next year or the year after again to bring it back because it's with COVID, it's kind of had a couple of years out. But we've done it for five years out of those 10 years, and it's been a great success. And it's interesting because... It brings the community together again because they always ask my mum, oh, when is the next time you're doing an event? When is the next time we're going to have a dinner dance? Because it's not just for just Gormal, but it's for people to get together as a community. Not have, it doesn't have to be a wedding or, or like a 21st birthday. It's more in the sense of coming together to have a good time. Let your hair down, have a drink, relax, dance around, but also doing it in her memory. And that's what she'd like to do. So yeah, the charity is great. And that gets people on the register and does it from a perspective to keep us kind of some people alive who've got cancer. But on the second side, it's the the, the partying, the enjoyment at a dinner dance, which uh, we really enjoy putting on and brings everyone together to mainly remember her. Mm -hmm.